If I can have your attention again, please. Uh, please uh, enjoy your desserts as they are served. Uh, while you're doing that, I'd like to give you a little bit of perspective on the Arbuckle Award and recognize a few past recipients. Each year, the Arbuckle Award honors a Stanford Graduate School of Business alumnus, alumna, or an individual closely connected with the school for their lifelong achievement in the areas of management, leadership, and community service. It is appropriate that Ernie was the first recipient, and we are privileged to have several members of the Arbuckle family with us this evening. Would they please stand and be recognized? Since 1968, 40 other individuals have received the Arbuckle Award. 12 of them are here with us this evening. I would like to recognize each of them and ask that they stand as I call their names. From the MBA class of 48, the 2008 winner was Henry Sagerstrom. A 1967 MBA and a 69 PhD, the 2007 winner was Henry McKinnell. From the class of 62, the winner in 2006 was Stephen Adams. John Scully from the class of 68 won the award in 2002. <laughs> from the class of 78, the 99 winner, and my dinner mate this evening, Rebecca Morgan. In 1996, the award went to someone from the class of 1957, John Morgridge. <laughs> from the class of 64 in 1989, John Lilly. In 1987, the winner was Secretary of State George Shultz. <laughs> From the class of 54 in 1983, Bruce Atwater. In 1978, from the class of 58, John Young. In 1975, the winner was Dean Emeritus R.J. Miller. <laughs> From the class of 48 in 1974, the winner was Stephen Bechtel. I would now like to thank all of the fellowship donors who are here tonight. There are more than 80 of you in this room. I'd like you to stand and to remain standing for a moment, please. Standing, stay standing for a moment, please. I would like to recognize more than 70 fellowship recipients who are uh, fortunate to have received fellowships from you who are here this evening. Would they please stand?
Thanks so much to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great pleasure to bring to the stage a man who has served the GSB faculty and the Stanford community for more than 40 years. George Parker is the faculty director of the Stanford Sloan's Master's Program and the Dean Witter Distinguished Professor of Finance Emeritus. He has served on the faculty senate and on various selection committees during his tenure. He is a recipient of the 2006 Distinguished Teaching Award and the Robert T. Davis Award. And I'm sure that you will agree that he is simply one of the most likable personalities at the GSB. Please join me in welcoming to the stage George Parker. Oh my goodness, what a, what a nice event. Thank you, Garth, and good evening. Tonight is indeed a magnificent event, a chance to honor and recognize Bob Joss, the immediate past dean of the GSB and one of the school's most accomplished and inspirational graduates. He's also a person that I have known very well for 47 years, beginning in 1965 when we both entered the PhD program at the GSB on the very same day. Also, on an evening like tonight, I could not help but remember that Bob and I attended our first Arbuckle Award dinner 37 years ago when Dean R.J. Miller was the honoree and Dean Ernie Arbuckle himself made the introduction. Little did either of us know then that 37 years later, Bob himself would be the Arbuckle Award recipient. Tonight is that day. Bob's life, his career, his contributions to Stanford and to the society at large have been nothing short of exceptional. And that, of course, is what the Arbuckle Award is all about. To begin, Bob was raised in Spokane, Washington, where he lived until he left for college in Seattle at the University of Washington. It was clear even in high school that Bob was a star. He was president of the student body at Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane, one of the oldest high schools in the United States. Indeed, Lewis and Clark High School was founded 50 years before Stanford University. But it was at the University of Washington where Bob most formidably demonstrated his natural leadership talent. Are you ready for this? Bob was president of the freshman class, president of the sophomore class, recipient of the Oval Award chosen by students and faculty for the most outstanding freshman or sophomore student among the student body of 30,000 students. This was followed by election to Phi Beta Kappa with the class of 1963 and president of the student body at the University of Washington. His, his collegiate career makes one realize again that sometimes, just sometimes, smart, good guys do finish first. <laughs> it was also at the University of Washington where Bob met his wife-to-be, Betty Badger, the woman who has clearly been the most valuable player on his team for the last 49 years. It's a very proud and devoted partner, Betty, who is here tonight with Bob's two children, Randy Joss and Jennifer Joss, his daughter-in-law, Joan Joss, a couple of grandchildren, I can't count them all, Matthew is here, I guess, uh, and his brother and sister-in-law, we welcome the entire Joss clan. When When Bob entered the PhD program in 1965, he was also a member of the Sloan program, as those were the days when six members of the Sloan class were also doctoral candidates. Bob managed not only to complete the doctoral program in record time, I might add dragging and helping me along the way, 
but he also managed to earn an MBA with the class of 1967. This meant that Bob wound up being the first dean to graduate from all three of the school's major programs, <laughs> the MBA, the Sloan, and the PhD program. Along with the three degrees that his son Randy earned at Stanford and the PhD that his daughter Jennifer earned from the School of Education, I've sometimes thought Bob's family has enough Stanford degrees to wallpaper a small office. <laughs> On completion of the doctoral program, Bob won a national competition to be a White House fellow in the year 1967-68. Ernie Arbuckle, who was then dean of the school, encouraged Bob to compete for the White House Fellowship. And since Ernie was chair of the original selection committee, Ernie had a good idea how the competition was going to play out. And it did. But after a great year as a White House fellow, working with the Secretary of the Treasury, Bob was then invited at age 27 to become Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Monetary Affairs, one of the youngest Deputy Assistant Secretaries of the Treasury in the Treasury's history. After two years there, finishing his service in government, Bob joined the Wells Fargo Bank in San Francisco, where Ernie had become chairman of the board. <laughs> Bob's career at Wells was spectacular. I like to say he rose like a cork in water. And in 17 short years, he was vice chairman of the bank. In 1992, however, Bob's phone rang with an unusual opportunity and an adventure. He, he courageously chose to accept it. That was the year he became CEO of the Westpac Bank in Sydney, Australia, Australia's oldest and largest bank. It had 45,000 employees. Bob's tenure at Westpac was nothing short of phenomenal. Westpac was a true turnaround situation, and Bob turned it around. During his six-year tenure, he reversed its losses, tripled the market value of the bank, and repositioned it strategically to reemerge re as Australia's most successful financial institution. He arrived in Australia as a non-Australian CEO who was asked to bring his leadership and American management skills to rescue a company that was truly an Australian icon. With that track record, he left Australia six years later as a preeminent international banking leader. That takes Bob to 1999, when the search committee for a new dean at the GSB recognized Bob's accomplishments, his leadership, his career, his academic credentials, and his great commitment to Stanford and invited him to be the eighth dean of the school. It was a great day for the school and a great day for Stanford. As dean of the business school, Bob was a major change agent with a long list of accomplishments. He set records in fundraising, the most conspicuous example being the construction of our new $350 million campus, the Knight Management Center. I know Bob feels huge gratitude to Phil Knight for his leadership gift for the campus and for the many gifts to the GSB's new home that people in this room also made. Bob championed a new curriculum and appointed Garth Saloner, our current dean, to be chair of the Curriculum Review Committee. The new curriculum recognizes the diverse nature of our student body, the increasing importance of international management, and the use of both smaller and larger classes to address the individualized needs of students in a modern MBA program. Finally, Bob emphasized collaboration with other schools in the university, including the advent of several joint degree programs between the business school and the schools of education, medicine, law, and engineering. At the end of Bob's term as dean, it's safe to say that never has the business school been in held in such high esteem across the rest of the campus. These comments could go on and on, but they won't because there's no way with any sort of introduction like this to do justice of all the reasons why my colleagues on the faculty, my colleagues on the staff, 
So many students and alumni feel that Stanford Business School was simply exceedingly fortunate to have had Bob Joss as dean for the 10-year period from 1999 to 2009. Further, I have to say as an aside and on a strictly personal note, it has to occur to an old friend like me how pleased Ernie Arbuckle himself would have been to see the person in whom he took so much interest now to receive the, the award that has his name on it. Bob, we salute you, we honor you, and on the occasion of an evening like this, the school recognizes you for all you've done in your life and your career to represent the best that Stanford has to offer. As George said, wow. George, that was, as my Australian friends might say, a bit over the top, <laughs> but nice. You know, he's had 47 years to work on that introduction. <laughs> this is such a great evening for me, and it's especially nice to have a number of old friends, some from a long ways away, a number of my family members with me. I'm sorry that just a few couldn't be here. My mother, who's approaching 98 and just can't travel. My brother, uh, younger brother, Dick, who had a commitment to give a talk in Florida tonight. And uh, four of my grandchildren. But they are very ably represented by the eldest, who is here tonight, Matthew. But since this is a video that they'll get to see later, I just want to say for the video, we're thinking of you guys, and we miss you very much tonight. You know, one of the great joys of being Dean is the people you get to meet and the stories that you hear. And often those stories begin with this phrase, I wouldn't have done what I've done, and I wouldn't be who I am without the Stanford GSB. And that's exactly how I would begin my own story here tonight. Betty and I came here, as George said, in the fall of 1965 with Randy and Jennifer. I hadn't planned to come. I'd never seen Stanford and actually knew very little about it. I was primed to go to that other school on the Charles River. <laughs> but for reasons I can't even quite recall, I made a late in the process decision to apply to Stanford as well. This led to a very attractive fellowship offer. And when you're a young parent with two small children, fellowship aid is mighty important. As is so wonderfully underscored by this room full of fellowship donors and their recipients. But it was really more than the fellowship. Every Stanford person who contacted me was just so extremely nice. They really wanted me to come. And a great lesson in my life has been to cast my lot with nice people in places where you're wanted. Our school in 1965 was much better than I could have ever imagined. The intellectual vitality, the quality of the faculty were like nothing I had ever seen before. Ernie Arbuckle, Jim Howell, the faculty leadership were just transforming the school. They were ramping up rigor and relevance and pursuing excellence. They managed to combine the teaching genius of old timers like Ted Kreps and Harry Rathbun and Jim Porterfield with world leading outside scholars like Lee Bach and Ezra Solomon and Hal Levitt and new young scholars who they brought in like Bob Janicki and Bob Wilson, Alex Robichek. And in my year, 
young Jim Van Horn. <laughs> and I got to take classes with all of them. What a gift. I can truly say that at Stanford, I learned how to think. And I learned how to learn. How to think critically and analytically, to think for myself, to make questioning and learning a lifelong habit to express my argument concisely. You know, I've come to understand, being the dean, that great schools are not about professors transferring their knowledge to students. Great schools are about ensuring that students leave with learning habits that last a lifetime. And that's exactly what Stanford did for me. Throughout my career, I usually found that I could be very able at identifying and defining problems, generating and evaluating alternative solutions, and moving a group constructively toward improvement. You know, once at a meeting in Canberra, Australia, a participant pulled me aside at the break and said, you know, I noticed that when you speak, people really seem to listen. How do you do that? And a corporate secretary on a board I once served said, how is it you seem to know the right question to ask all the time? And in both instances, I thought to myself, you know, I learned much of that at the Stanford Business School. But uh, of course, one combines the knowledge from school with the experiences of life to really generate deeper learning and insight. And I've been blessed with some really great work experiences from which to learn. I had a director at, Wells Far at uh, Westpac uh, who loved to say whenever we play, faced particularly challenging circumstances, he'd say, boy, this is such a character building experience. <laughs> and I can tell you when you assume leadership of an iconic but troubled company in a foreign country under intense scrutiny and without your own support team, there are lots of opportunities to build character. <laughs> but that strong foundational GSB knowledge base that allows you to make sense out of those tough experiences, for me, it was as they say in that MasterCard commercial, priceless. You know, students often ask me, what do I think is more important? Is it what you learn here or the class network that you develop here? Obviously, both are very important, but for me, I had this unusual experience where I had very few classmates. I was one of 20 Sloans in the first year, a combined MBA, PhD student in the second year, and a dissertation writing doctoral student the third year. So my social network at the GSB was not at all like today's MBA students. You know, Betty and I have wonderful lifelong friends from our time here. They're all here tonight. And our friends were Escondido village mates rather than MBA classmates. So for me, the GSB learning really trumped the class network. But in a different and wonderful way, the Stanford network just stayed and grew with me all my life. And in my case, it was more of a school network than a graduating class network. And a number of prior Arbuckle honorees were a key part of that network. As I look through that list of 41 names, I have to tell you how incredibly thrilled and humble I am to be added to this list. I've been so fortunate to have known or met almost every single one of them. And with some, I really had very special relationships. Relationships that have truly shaped who I am. For example, in the first seven years of the award, four of the honorees were directors at Wells Fargo. <laughs> Two of them are here tonight, R.J. Miller and John Young. You know, very early in my career, I got to watch R.J. and John and Ed Littlefield in action. It was like a fantastic director college, long before any such training program ever existed. You know, I've always remembered and followed RJ's sage advice 
when it ever became necessary to pursue expense reductions. RJ said, if you're gonna chop off a dog's tail, measure it carefully and do it once, <laughs> not an inch at a time. <laughs> I could talk about these three for a long time, but the important point is how much I learned from RJ and Ed and John about being a good board member. The Arbuckle honoree in 1974 was Steve Bechtel, who's also here tonight. And I first met Steve in the 70s when I was a young executive at Wells Fargo, and we were bankers to the Bechtel Group. And since retiring as dean, I've been working extensively with Bechtel. It is an amazing company led by a wonderful family and doing remarkable work all over the world. The engineering and construction industry is a totally new experience for me, and I can tell you I'm learning so much being there. But I'm also learning so much seeing this incredible culture that four generations of family leadership could build in one institution. Last year, we celebrated Steve's 70th anniversary working for the firm. How's that for career commitment? <laughs> In 1987, we honored George Schultz, who's also here tonight. I met Secretary Schultz when he was Secretary of Labor, and I was a 27-year-old working at the Treasury Department. He was an inspiration to me then, and he is even more so today as I watch him. And I was just at a seminar, actually, this afternoon with him, having this impact on policy all over the world. And it was George who, early in my tenure, reminded me, and George was a former dean of the Chicago Business School. He said, Bob, remember, old deans never die. They just lose their faculties. <laughs> and throughout my career, I've made it a habit of erring on the side of leaving a place relatively early when people seem to want me to stay, rather than a bit later when they might be wondering, why hadn't he left yet? <laughs> I found it to be a rather good practice. In 1993, the Arbuckle was awarded to John Gardner, somebody I first met at age 26. He was an incredible and inspirational national leader, and yet he was so humble and approachable. He was a gifted writer and teacher, and John's writings on leadership and renewal just resonate so strongly with me as among the very best work in a very crowded field. John encouraged me to teach an MBA class on leadership, which is something I've been doing now for the last 12 years with great satisfaction. And I know I've learned as much about leadership from teaching it as practicing it. And much of my teaching draws on John's writing and on his personal example. John reminded me that every great leader is clearly teaching, and every great teacher is leading. And among John's really stellar attributes was that he and Ernie were great lifelong friends. Which brings me to our first Arbuckle honoree and the namesake for this award, Ernie Arbuckle. Ernie was my dean during all three years at the GSB. And, you know, as a student, one only knows the dean from quite a distance. But I think it's fair to say that the students of my generation, and there are a number of us here tonight, we really admired Dean Arbuckle. We admired his passion for the school, his drive to make it a leading school, his personal integrity and strong sense of ethics the ease with which he moved between academia and business and among students, faculty, staff, and alumni. The example that he just set personally. He was a consummate people person. Ernie enjoyed being with people and they really enjoyed being with him. And from our first meeting when I was an entering student, little did I imagine that our lives would stay closely connected over the next 20 years. 
As George said, after leaving the GSB, I was a White House fellow. The fellowship was John Gardner's brainchild, but he and Ernie, no accident there, were members of that national commission that selected the fellows. And when it came time to leave Washington, D.C., and I decided to pursue a banking career, I went to Wells Fargo, where Ernie was chairman. I, but I looked at several other employment opportunities, and some with higher pay. But this was another one of those examples of casting my lot with nice people and places where I knew I was wanted. I enjoyed a special relationship with Ernie over the next 14 or 15 years until both he and Kitty were lost to all of us in that tragic car crash. Ernie was another terrific role model, but he was also a great counselor and mentor to me. He always had time for me, as he invariably did for any young person who sought him out. John Gardner said it best at Ernie's memorial service when he said, I think we would all agree he had a genius for friendships. You know, my work life has been devoted to helping relatively larger, older, important institutions change for the better. That's been a consistent leadership theme for me since leaving school. It might seem odd for a school in the middle of startup conscious Silicon Valley to have such a person be the dean. But then this valley is also well known for former startups that transformed themselves into some pretty large, spectacular enterprises. For me, it has been really fulfilling work and the kind of work that I feel is so important in our society. To try, in borrowing Lou Gerstner's phrase, to try to make an elephant dance. And in working to make those elephants dance, the people I've mentioned tonight, RJ and Ed and John Young and Steve and George, John Gardner and Ernie, they were enormously inspirational to me and therefore influential. It falls to each of us to make sense of our lives and to define a vision of ourselves in our work life and then live that as an example to others. And each of these men who came into my life because of Stanford set examples for me, examples of leadership, integrity, focus, commitment to advance the institution you serve. And in turn, it has fallen to me to try to set that example for others. That's the way Stanford works. That's the most valuable thing you learn here. People often ask me, how and why did you become the dean at Stanford? For me, the opportunity was fortuitous, but the decision was easy. One can never plan these things. As George mentioned, it just happened. The school and the search committee were searching for a dean at exactly the same time I had decided to retire from a long and very fulfilling career in banking. I'd spent 22 years at Wells Fargo helping them to achieve a real position of international prominence, and six years at Westpac, helping them recover and regain Australian leadership. I wanted to return to the Bay Area, both Betty and I did, but to have another career. To repot, as John and Ernie loved to say, into a new challenge. I had no idea what that challenge might be. And when the search committee invited me to at least come visit with them, well, I thought I should accept that invitation. And in talking with the search committee, I must say, the job seemed really daunting. Venturing into a leadership role in an academic institution, it was definitely something outside my comfort zone. Definitely seemed daunting, but then I remembered just how daunting it was to consider moving to Australia and taking on the Westpac Challenge. And it had worked out okay for me. And even more important, perhaps, I kept thinking of Ernie and RJ, two of my heroes, and how wonderful it would be to serve the school as they had, to be a part of that legacy. 
You know, school had done so much for me if I could draw on all of my experiences since leaving and somehow help make it an even better place. Well, what could be better than that? Few people ever get such a chance. John Gardner wrote to congratulate me on undertaking what he described as such a wonderful act of public service. You know, I never really thought of it that way. But when I went to visit John shortly after returning to Stanford to take up the role, I knew I'd made the right decision. We had a memorable conversation about leadership, about the school, about taking on this new role as dean. And near the end, he turned to a picture on his bookshelf, a picture of John and Ernie enjoying each other's company. And he said, you know, Bob, Ernie would be so happy knowing you're the dean. I can tell you that this night, receiving this award, honoring me in Ernie's name, makes me so happy. Thank you for this great honor and this wonderful evening. Thank you. Congratulations again, Bob, and thank you for those tremendous years of service. That concludes our program for this evening. Thank you all so much for being here with us to make it the special evening that it was. It is a tradition here at this event to invite each table to nominate somebody from the table to please leave with the centerpiece. And with that, have a great evening, and we hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>